Jenny Mathers, and I'm the head of the International Politics Department, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Lily Kirky, who's going to be giving her inaugural lecture. Um, so I want to say a few words about Amelia um, and her background and her interests before I step down and, and give her the stage. But I just say at the outset that um, by tradition, there are no questions following an inaugural lecture. So Amelia is going to speak, and then instead of questions, we're going to go out into the foyer and have um, a reception and mix and mingle. And so if you have any burning questions to ask her, following on what she said tonight, you can pose them over a glass of wine, uh, which is much more civilized. Than, so. In spite of the fact that Amelia did her undergraduate degree at the University of Hull, um, I still like to think of her as a homegrown effort. Um, she did her master's and her PhD here in the department. Um, and in fact, that's where I first met her when she was a PhD student. And she was a PTTS on one of my modules. And I will. Yeah, so there we are. Um, Amelia went away again after, um, after, for a bit after the PhD, but she came back um, to Apple and joined the department as full time academic staff um, in 2006. She has um, a wide range of uh, research interests, um, starting out with um, international relations theory, as, as many of you will know. Um, her book, Causation and in International Relations, was published with Cambridge University Press in 2008, um, based on the PhD that she wrote when she was here in Amber. And the PhD won the best dissertation prize of Visa and PSA. So, um, not a modest achievement here. The book itself has been very influential in the field um, as affecting how we think about causation um, and what it means methodologically and theoretically to do causal analysis. Amelia has published a wide range of articles, um, ranging in subject from the study of causation, to reflections on the ro role of critical theory in international relations, to EU foreign policy and governmentality, and more recently, the role of cosmology in thinking about high art, which we'll hear more about, um, I think, in a bit. She is co-editor and co-author of various books, um, but especially um, co-editor of International Relations Theories, Discipline and Diversity which was published in OUP in 2006 and has subsequently had uh, further editions in 2009 and 2013. Um, co-author, sorry, co-editor with Tim Dunn and Steve Smith, um, who also uh, formed key parts of their career here in this department. Milia then, um, in between 2008 and 2012, um, was the principal investigator of a major European Research Council uh, funded project on um, democracy promotion, um, and out of that project came um, a sort of new direction in her career, um, which involved um, working with policy makers and the policy community, um, and uh, as well as a book called Democratic Futures, um, Re-envisioning Democracy Promotion in 2013. Um, her work with practitioners um, led to one of our impact case studies for the last rep. Um, and uh, it's, it's led to lots of interesting um, ideas within the department as well as um, in Amelia's own work um, about the relationship between theory um, and practice. Amelia is exceptionally active in the department. Um, she's one of our most um, active teachers, undergraduate students, postgraduate students, um, you know, PhD students. Um, she's generally uh, a key element of, of the life of the department, the intellectual life and the social life as well. Um, generally, um, Amelia does uh, really asks really interesting, big, important questions, uh, the kinds of big, important questions that, that many of us are a bit too scared um, to ask sometimes, and I think she'll be asking some of those tonight, um, when she gives us her inaugural lecture entitled Concepts, International Relations, and the Universe. So please welcome Amelia. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for the introduction. And thank you also for the patience uh, that the department uh, has shown me in the last three years as I've been trying to hold off this lecture. Uh, so thank you, Richard, uh, for your patience. Thank you, Andrew Linkler for your, Linklater, for your patience in allowing me to put this uh, off. The reason I've been putting it off is in part because I wanted to present uh, something new, uh, something uh, new that I was working on but hadn't quite gotten to the stage where I could feel like I could present it. Well, 
Today, I suppose, I feel like I can at least try and present some of these ideas with you, but thank you for the patience in allowing me to try to develop them a little bit further uh, in the last uh, few years. Thanks also for uh, everyone for coming along. Uh, it's really nice to see everyone here. I want to especially thank two people in the front here, my parents, who have made it from Finland to listen to me. It's really special that they're here. Uh, hopefully the trip, which is very long, <laughs> uh, isn't a wasted one. Uh, I very much hope not. Now, in tonight's lecture, what I want to address is the title Concepts, International Relations and the Universe, as you can see. Now, the title may sound a little bit grand, uh, but actually the aim of the lecture is quite specific. I want to talk about the challenges we face when we use concepts in international relations, uh, how we conceptualize international relations, but I want to talk about those challenges of conceptualization in the context of thinking about some challenges of conceptualization in the universe. Now, the move to the universe may sound a little bit strange at this stage, I hope, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure you won't be surprised that I address the issue of concepts. For the last 15 years or so, my research has always addressed in one way or another the concepts that we use to try to know something about this thing we call international relations. Conceptions and concept concepts and conceptualizations, as I hope to show today, is where, is where a lot of the politics and the negotiations of ethics and the struggles for power in international politics is actually kind of at. When we discuss cliches like one man's terrorist is another one's freedom fighter. We all have a sense, I think, of the importance of <coughs> concepts uh, for how we act and how we described, uh, describe this thing we call international politics. We also, I think, have an intense sense of the contested meanings uh, of a lot of the concepts that we use. I want to talk today about the challenges uh, of contest contestedness of concepts uh, and also the trickiness of concepts in, in general. Uh, but I want to show that there's something really pervasively tricky uh, uh, and pervasively difficult uh, about concepts. Um, um, and I begin today by addressing quite simply the question of why are concepts challenging in international relations, in the study of international relations? How might we, how might we learn something? How might we study international relations in a diff different way if we rethink and reflect on the kinds of concepts that we use? I will briefly illustrate some of these arguments in relation to some of my own work on causation and democracy, which are two key concepts, I suppose, that I've been working with uh, for the last fair few years, uh, longer than I care to remember, I suppose. Uh, now, in the second part of the lecture, I want to do something a little bit different, and I want to uh, push you, and I suppose in some senses I'm trying to push myself, to think a little bit further about the challenges of conceptualization. And I want to do so from the point of view of a scientific cosmology, something that I've become very interested in uh, in the last fair few years. Now, from this perspective of scientific cosmology, concepts appear as even trickier than I've ever uh, thought uh, they are. Uh, but also, I, arg I will argue today uh, that certain kind of cosmology, what I call relational cosmology, can also perhaps help us in dealing with some, some of these challenges of conceptualizations. I think it can help us in terms of thinking about the limits of our concepts, but perhaps also it can push us to think about international relations in some, some new ways. Now, by the end of the lecture, um, you might be feeling a little bit maybe uncomfortable or disoriented, perhaps as most of the students, that are, those of you that are my students, you know, in many ways my efforts often revolve around trying to disorient or even confuse us. But I hope by the end of it, at least, uh, even if you don't agree with some of the moves in the lecture, I hope you at least agree with me that concepts are very, very puzzling, at the same time very, very limiting, but also at the same time very politically important uh, for us to debate. Now, let's start then with some initial orientations. Why care about concepts? in the study of international relations, what on earth could be interesting about concepts? Well, concepts are fundamental to all of us and to our study of international relations. They are, if you like, the mental images that we use to organize our perceptions uh, of the world. Uh, and as such, we, of course, through concepts, organize also how we see the world, how we see so-called facts in the world, but also how we act in the world. 
Think of international relations. Fundamentally, international relations, of course, revolves around its concepts. Its concepts of sovereignty, states, anarchy, self-interest, power, globalization, and so on. These kinds of concepts organize uh, your head, uh, my head, and they also organize the practices of international relations, the passport controls, wars, treaty negotiations, and so on. So to twist the words of Ken Booth and Leon Trotsky, in fact, uh, you may not be interested in concepts of international relations, but the concepts of international relations are very much interested in you. Now, more important than, than studying facts about interna international politics is actually to think seriously about how we conceptualize, how we make sense, and how we organize uh, the so-called facts out there through our concepts. But thinking of, through concepts is also tricky, because of course, of course in international relations, concepts are always uh, contested, quite often at least, contested. They're contested at least in two kinds of ways. First, um, we don't often agree which concepts we should use to describe things that we see. So for one person, uh, a freedom fighter, uh, is a, some, someone is a freedom fighter, for another person, that same person is a terrorist. At the same time, for someone, uh, a leader is an autocrat, for another, they're actually some sort of a democrat. Well, some people say that there's a global civil society out there. For others, the whole concept of global civil society is just uh, an illusion. So we disagree about how and which concepts, if you like, uh, we should use when it comes to international politics. But even trickier is the fact that we actually also disagree most of the time, quite intensely, about the meanings that individual concepts have for us. So for example, the concept of democracy does not mean at all the same thing for everyone on this planet. For a liberal democrat, democracy is associated with the concepts of freedom, elections and rights. For a social democrat, democracy is all about equality of opportunity and, and socio-economic forms of equality. So a different, um, there are different conceptual universes, if you like, through which we give meaning to the kinds of concepts that we use. And as such, even when we use the same concepts, of course, uh, we can quite severely talk past each other. This is in part why in international relations, and also in everyday life, I think, uh, we quite, quite often end up disagreeing, talking past each other and misunderstanding. Now, concepts and conceptualizations are interesting, uh, not just because they're contested, but because also they come from somewhere. So none of us are born, really, uh, with our conceptual systems. Our conceptual universes, if you want to call them that, the way in which we come to define the meanings of concepts, they arise from socially constructed and negotiated uh, environments. We inherit our concepts from our mothers, even, uh, but also from our nations, our religions, and also the academic disciplines and academic uh, locations in which, we, uh, in, in which we study. Indeed, our conceptual universes often reflect, quite fundamentally, where we are or where we come from. And, but also, as such, they also uh, uh, reflect our ideologies, political struggles sometimes, as well as, as, well as power relations that we're in. Now, taking on concepts, then, uh, is important, I think, but it's also quite challenging. What does it do, then, to think about international relations uh, from a conceptual point of view? Let me illustrate this briefly with some of my own work on causation uh, and also democracy. Now, my PhD thesis explored the concept of cause, which nobody could see the attraction of except, I suppose, think myself, because I found it a really puzzling concept. Puzzling for various reasons in the study of international relations. Puzzling, first of all, because it was a very contested concept in the uh, uh, late, two, uh, late, late 1990s, early 2000s, when I started exploring it. There are some people in international relations, the study of international relations, that argue that international relations is all about the study of causes. The causes of wars, the causes of famines, the causes of interventions. And to understand causality, what we need are scientifically rigorous methods uh, of, of, of studying patterns of behavior out in the world. Through studying patterns of behavior, we can perhaps understand what might be the causal laws that drive international politics, whether it's a kind of causal laws of, of war or whether it's causal laws like democratic peace, democracies don't fight each other. But many critical theorists in international relations at the same time despised, if you like, uh, the use of the concept of cause. 
Partly because causation and the concept of cause falsely seems to represent the study of international relations as something that is uh, somehow akin to the study of physics, with laws, regularities, objectively noble causes. This kind of description of international relations not only hides the socially constructed nature of a lot of our knowledge through concepts, but also, it was argued, fuels uh, Western interventions uh, by making us think that we can then control the causes that we find. But for me, what, was, what became interesting about causation in the end was not actually the contestation about the concept of cause, but rather the fact that both the positivist and the post-positivist critical theorists actually had an, uh, a stunning agreement about what they meant by the concept of cause. They both worked, the haters, if you like, uh, the critics, uh, as well as the fans of causation, they worked with a very specific, rather narrow meaning of the concept of cause. From them, Causes imag or were imagined as kind of pushing and pulling mechanistic uh, type of relations between things. At the same time, causal analysis was fundamentally tied to this analysis of regularities uh, of events through which we can then analyze the patterns in the pushing and pulling mechanistic relations uh, in the world. Now this conceptual universe, if you like, for thinking about causation has a social uh, uh, history arising from 17th and 18th century science and philosophy. But of course, it is not just uh, the end of the line for us in terms of how we might think about causation. I argued in my PhD uh, and the book that came out afterwards that we should reconceptualize uh, the meaning of the notion of cause, to put it, if you like, in a different conceptual universe. I tried to provide a different conceptual universe by combining scientific realist uh, literature and Aristotle's uh, much richer uh, notion of causality. I don't have time to go into the details of what I argued exactly, but let me just say that causation in this conceptual uh, uh, universe, if you like, wasn't imagined as something that is mechanistic. Uh, causes instead cause in different kinds of ways. Various facilitating and conditioning causes are, e are causal too, just in different ways from mechanistic uh, types of causality. Causes here also were not something that could be traced through observable regularities uh, in patterns of behavior, but rather causal analysis fundamentally uh, entails uh, interpretation and conceptualization of really quite unpredictable and unobservable types of causes, reasons that we might have for action, norms that we work with, as well as the role of uh, social structures. So in a sense, this new meta-theory of causation sought to challenge the dominant uh, social construction, if you like, of the meaning of the concept of cause in academia, especially in this subject of international relations. But also, it's important to note uh, that this conceptual rethinking, philosophical, if you like, rethinking of causation, also has political overtones. I think all conceptualizations have political overtones, and so does this one. First, in denying the language of causal laws in international politics, I think I was trying to actually uh, challenge the kinds of legitimations or justifications for action that are sometimes used in international politics. So the Iraq war, for example, uh, for some was justified on the basis uh, uh, of claims about putting into practice our knowledge about the causal law of democratic peace. Well, if we don't have causal laws of things like democratic peace, then quite simply, we also don't have those kinds of justifications uh, for action. On the other hand, what I was trying to do uh, with the uh, causation uh, work was also, I think, to save a kind of emancipatory politics uh, uh, from post-structuralist or relativist uh, kinds of criticisms. If we have real causes, if we have causes of war and pro poverty, then also we can tackle these things. We have a reason to go out there, I suppose, and save people, even if it's only through conceptualizing things in different kinds of ways. Now, in addressing causes, I think the other thing I was trying to do, politically speaking, was also to point to particular types of causal uh, factors which often were ignored in at least some of the positivist types of uh, ways of studying causation. And that is structural forms of causation. Capitalism, patriarchy, and so on, as structural conditioning types of causality that don't necessarily push and pull on us, but yet still have very important causal effects uh, on us. Now what this illustrates, I hope, is that conceptual thinking and, and rethinking, if you like, 
even when it's abstract and philosophical, it's also involved quite intensely, or at least indirectly, in negotiating how we see the world and also how we might politically act or engage uh, uh, with the world. Now, similar kinds of concerns then uh, played out in my studies of democracy and democracy promotion. Since 2008, I ran a, a big EU-funded project uh, which essentially asked if democracy is a contested concept, what kind of democracy is actually being promoted by Western states and international organizations? Uh, my team and I, we interviewed a whole number of practitioners and NGO activists and so on to try to understand what kind of democracy was being uh, promoted, supported uh, out in, in these practices of democracy promotion, which billions of, of, of dollars and euros are put into nowadays. Now what we found is that at the heart of democracy promotion practice is a, a rather specific understanding of the concept of democracy, a, a, a liberal concept of democracy. And we also found that the slippage, if you like, to a liberal understanding of democracy in democracy promotion practice has a whole number of uh, consequences, a lot of them fairly negative, in fact. Importantly, the failure to think about social democracy or participatory democracy or Islamic democracy as valid and real types of understandings of the concept of democracy for some people in the world meant that donors uh, of democracy aid often don't see uh, the democratic activists out there uh, in many of the target countries uh, that they like to get involved with. Democracy promotion, if you like, is blinkered uh, by the conceptual universe uh, within which the policy practice is, 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 is undertaken, which in turn explains in part why democracy promoters fail to have what they call leverage, uh, that is influence on the ground. Uh, in fact, they're nowadays mostly uh, ignored or pushed out uh, from the debates on the ground, partly because there's a misunderstanding about, the which, about which kinds of democracy uh, we should be talking about. Now, as Jenny mentioned, uh, interestingly, and for me quite surprisingly, a lot of the practitioners of democracy promotion actually became very interested in thinking about this uh, conceptual set of problems when it comes to democracy uh, promotion. In the end, uh, uh, myself and, and Jeff uh, ran a whole number of uh, seminars uh, in the US uh, and, uh, and also in EU, trying to engage with the practitioner of practitioners of democracy promotion to try to uh, give them a sense of how they might uh, open up, broaden out uh, their conceptions of democracy and what the, con and what the policy implications practically uh, for their work uh, might be. This illustrates in some regard uh, the conceptual, conceptual reflection, even though it's, for me, in some sense is inherently interesting, it's also, I think, politically important and also, in some senses, can be quite policy, uh, policy relevant. Now, hopefully you can see from this fairly brief account uh, uh, why we should pay attention to concepts how we use concepts, how we negotiate the meanings of concepts, uh, and, and also how we come to act in the world through our concepts uh, in particular kinds of ways. But while all of this is quite important, uh, what I want to suggest now is that uh, so far, in many senses, we're only scraping uh, uh, the surface of the trickiness of concepts. I want to share with you uh, why I think uh, why I think this now, and also in so, in so doing, I want to bring you with me to the journey of the puzzles of conceptualization considered from the point of view of scientific uh, cosmology. Now here, um, I will proceed in stages. And our first stage is perhaps uh, the most uh, surprising or disagreeable to a lot of the humanists and social scientists in this room. Because I will not start from the analysis of how we humans uh, 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 have thought about the cosmos over time, how we have historically developed our conceptions of the cosmos over time, how we have, in a sense, socially constructed uh, the universe. Instead, I will start, perhaps controversially, but also quite unapologetically, uh, from the perspective of scientific cosmology uh, today, what it has to say to us about the nature of the universe and our role in it. If you're a humanist, instincts are screaming, then I'm asking you to bear with me because I hope to show that there is some method in the madness of starting from somewhere other than the humans and the conceptions of the universe. 
But what is this thing called scientific cosmology then? Uh, in simple terms, scientific uh, cosmology means the scientific theorization about this thing called the whole universe. The whole universe means uh, the big scale, the really macro scale, the biggest scales that we can think of when it comes to the universe, but also uh, at the same time the smallest scales, uh, quantum mechanics and so on, partly because the big, the very big and the very small are very intricately tied together in how we think about uh, the universe. Now the crucial question for many of you and also for myself is, what makes a scientific cosmology rather than another kind of uh, cosmology. Now, of course, all discussions of cosmology, including scientific cosmology, uh, they're conducted by human beings, socially constructed human beings, and such the way in which we think about cosmology, even scientific cosmology, of course, is in part constructed and influenced by uh, social uh, conceptions of the cosmos. But as a scientific realist uh, and a philosophical realist, I want to actually uh, push us further and I want to insist that the constructions of knowledge in scientific cosmology, even as they are inevitably of our concepts, of our socially inherited concepts, and we'll come to, back to that later, at the same time, these conceptualizations are developed uh, in the context, if you like, of the recalcitrance of the universe to our beliefs about it, the kind of resistance of the universe to our conceptualizations of it. And as such, for me, scientific cosmology is not reliant simply on, say, faith, as a lot of religious cosmology uh, is. It's also not uh, reliant on kind of common sense assumptions, unscrutinized common sense assumptions, as I think a lot of our common sense secular uh, cosmology is. Instead, scientific cosmology is explicitly trying to uh, test beliefs against evidence, test our beliefs about the universe against the universe, uh, and at the same time uh, it's open to scientific scrutiny, it's also trying to cohere with and make sense of the findings of theoretical uh, uh, and, and empirical uh, physics and other forms of, of science uh, from across different sciences. Now, the view that emerges from this perspective, I think, has something very interesting to say about our predicament of conceptualization, and we'll get to this later. But first, uh, what I want to do is uh, to take you through the history of the, of the universe, something uh, somewhat unusual uh, for a lecture in international politics, but we'll see how we do. Now. <laughs> It's a little reflected upon fact that when the discipline of international relations uh, was invented, developed, uh, uh, we say here in Aberystwyth that it was invented here, of course, in Aberystwyth, about 100 years ago, since we are coming up to a centenary. It's important to note that 100 years ago, we, humans, um, had no idea whatsoever that there was anything whatsoever outside of the uh, gal galaxy, the very galaxy that we're in, the Milky Way. We also had no conception at that time of anything called the so-called Big Bang, and we had no conception either of the origins of life in particular types of uh, fairly elementary uh, uh, interactions of elements in this universe. Today's scientific view of the universe and its evolution and our role in it is quite strikingly different. Today, we see humans as existing on a planet which travels uh, around a medium-sized star in one of the outer reaches uh, of the spiral arms of the galaxy Milky Way. You can probably see there's our sun and we're revolving uh, around it. The galaxy that we're in holds about 100 uh, billion stars. We're not quite sure. It could be up to 400 billion stars. The universe uh, we have access to holds at least the same amount of galaxies. And in this galaxy zoo, if you like, we get our local bearings uh, from the so-called local cluster encompassing Andromeda Galaxy on the side here uh, and Milky Way, but also a whole number of dwarf galaxies. Now, our local cluster and other billions of galaxies are part of so-called superclusters and cosmic scale, cosmic scale filaments of matter. Now, these were created quite early on uh, after the Big Bang and are held together by non-baryonic <coughs> forms of matter called dark matter, which we, again, do not know a great deal about uh, as yet, but we have some good theories about. Now, the biggest scale uh, we can see in the universe, of course, is our so-called observable uh, universe. 
Because of the expansion of space and the time that it takes for light to travel to us, we of course always look back uh, in time when we look into the observable universe. Interestingly, because of this, we can of course now observe the universe as it was very on, uh, very early on in its evolution. We can see some of the earliest galaxies and some of the earliest uh, stars, even though as we observe them, we of course observe them as they were in the past. <coughs> now, although uh, the very early universe, what lies beyond our observable universe uh, also uh, is still very much debated in scientific cosmology. This is in many ways actually the central debating ground of scientific, sci scientific cosmology today. We have a set of theories and testable hypotheses uh, about how we might think about what lies beyond the observable universe. Some suggest uh, that we exist in one of many kind of bubble universes in a master inflating uh, universe Others say uh, that there are kind of cycles of universes born out of the quantum effects in black holes. There is some disagreement here, partly because there hasn't been a perfectly good test yet for any of these theories. But there's also a lot of agreement, and there's a lot of agreement on the fact that some of these hypotheses are actually infinitely testable. Now, one piece, key piece of agreement, of course, is that all cosmologists are agreed that we are not, in any sense, uh, at the se in the center of the universe. We see these kinds of uh, uh, images, but these images portray simply the fact that we talk about the universe from where we are, where we inevitably have to uh, talk about the universe from where we are. We are still absolutely not in the center of the universe, and this is partly because there are no absolute coordinates in the universe. Partly uh, this is the case <coughs> because space itself now is theorized as being a uh, part of the emergent uh, property of relations, if you like, uh, of the universe. Space is not a, a background to things in the cosmos. Space itself is uh, a, a part of the evolution of the thing called, we call the universe. In a very similar sense, time, of course, itself is not a background. It is part of the universe. It arises from change uh, in the universe. So space and time, then, are part of the processes of the evolution of the universe. They are not a background of some kind uh, to things or evolution of other things in the universe. Now, zooming back in, um, stars, like our sun, of course, uh, we now know are self-regulating processes of energy and matter flow, as indeed are galaxies. In stars, it's the balance of gravitational energy and the pressure of uh, the energy emanating from the nuclear reactions that maintains these things we call the stars, the en energy-making processes of these things we call stars. When the balance of the forces uh, breaks down under gravity, some of the biggest stars, of course, we know, uh, go supernova. As we know, supernovae uh, are the origin of pretty much uh, every single particle uh, in, uh, in you, I suppose, and in me, and in this room, and in the solar system uh, itself. Sagan's cliche in that sense is very much true. We are all made of this thing called the stardust. Now, Earth itself, is made of the leftovers, if you like, uh, in the formation of the, of the sun under gravitational pressure, uh, the so-called accretion disk. This is a picture of the accretion disk uh, of, uh, that makes uh, planets. The Earth, of course, we know is still very much geophysically uh, active because of how and why it formed, but also we know that it's a self-regulating system in terms of acidity and gas composition. Now, now that we know more about um, the formation of elements uh, in stars, and we know more about how those elements make the planet. We also know a lot more about this so-called mystery uh, of life. We know that life, uh, like the Earth, formed from some of the most common elements in our region of the cosmos, carbon, sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen. We also know that life itself is a self-regulating uh, flow or processing, if you like, of energy that formed initially, scientists think, uh, in lipid uh, bubbles near these things, uh, black smokers, uh, deep sea vents, uh, essentially. And life, of course, we think formed uh, because uh, repetitive chemical reactions uh, started metabolizing, they started processing uh, energy. Now, 
Humans, of course, are a very recently evolved metabolizing kind of system. We evolved in a very specific evolutionary niche, uh, in a specific climate context, and also succeeded uh, in growing our numbers because we became rather efficient parasites uh, on plants and animals. We, of course, uh, continue to exist today, or we continue, if you like, to process ourselves symbiotically and parasitically with plants, animals, bacteria and fungi. We eat these things, we metabolize through them, our relations with them, in order to gain access to the sun's uh, energy, which of course all life, pretty much all life on this planet uh, relies on. Now around 50% of all the energy that we metabolize goes into our brains. Brains, we don't really fully understand yet with our brains, but they're basically uh, complex response systems which allow us to more efficiently, if you like, get at the stuff that we need to metabolize. At the same time, of course, the brains get us, allow us to get away uh, from those that try to metabolize us. Now, interestingly, humans uh, with their complex brains are also able to build stuff. Stuff that essentially recycles uh, matter and energy in new types of ways. We can uh, build dams and jet engines and rockets uh, which carry Hubble telescopes and so on. Now, through our brains, we are also, able to, of course, able to reflect. We can uh, communicate uh, and we can organize, uh, uh, if you like, matter and energy flows within the relations of humans. We can uh, organize cities, states and markets. And it's because humans can direct, of course, energy flows <laughs> that they can also, of course, uh, destroy life rather efficiently too. And because humans uh, have multiplied so very drastically in the last uh, 10,000 years or so especially, and because they are, by their very nature, because of their brains, very much energy guzzling, these characteristics, in a sense, have given rise to the problem, uh, problems, the complex co-living problems uh, that we're facing on the planet today, including, of course, the problem of war and the problems of international relations. Now, let's uh, leave the whistle-stop tour of the universe uh, right there and just ask the question, what, is this, what does this story mean? What do we make of this kind of story uh, of, the, of the universe? Now, I want to argue, uh, building on the work of a cosmologist and physicist called Lee Smolin, that there is something very interesting in this story. Implicit in this story are actually quite deep challenges to how we think of us, uh, our universe, but also how we conceptualize uh, within the universe. Today's scientific cosmology, uh, Lee Smolin argues, screams at us, if you like, to shift uh, some background assumptions and, if you like, conceptual universes within which we think of ourselves and how it is that we know. Lee Smolin argues that we should move, uh, we should move, Lee Smolin argues that we have to move to something uh, we might call relational cosmology. Now, the relational cosmology is very interesting, uh, and it's interesting and intriguing to me, partly because it tries to point to some deep legacies of quite problematic, problematic background assumptions uh, in terms of how it is that we uh, think. Our socially inherited uh, conceptual systems, uh, it is argued by Smolin, but also uh, others, tend to lead us to see and treat the universe, the universe as some sort of a background either created uh, by God or by nature, but something that which is essentially governed by some sort of universal laws of physics, either God's laws or nature's universal laws. We also tend to come to see, of, uh, see ourselves somehow as a special, intelligent, biologically distinct species who, even though they evolved uh, from a particular context of this planet, now has rational faculties, uh, now can understand, if you like, the laws of this cold universe, or indeed uh, God's universe, if, if you prefer to think about it like that. Now, relational cosmology tries to challenge some of our assumptions by making two fairly important arguments, I think. One on relationality, and the other one on uh, situated knowledge. The first move of relational cosmology is to force us to rethink relations. 
Much of physics, uh, but also much of our everyday thinking, works on the basis of thinking about the world in terms of things interacting against some sort of backgrounds. But what the relational cosmologists argue is that if we analyze the universe as a whole, then we are forced to admit that there's nothing that we could call a background, and there's nothing that we could actually call things. Relational cosmology emphasizes that the whole universe, every aspect of it, including space and time, is a network of relationships, causally interacting, and in so doing, creating new processes, new types of, uh, of, of, of self-organization and novelty. Now, relationality here, importantly, implies that to describe things in terms of things is a very rough conceptual description indeed. Uh, it's uh, so rough that perhaps we should uh, avoid it, even though it's very difficult uh, to avoid it. What relational cosmologists are arguing, that everything that we think of as things is actually really more like processes. Processes in the process of relating. So everything, like quarks, stars, rocks, cells or animals, are processes that are in relations, relating to relations in new kinds of ways. <coughs> and crucially, these processes, things, acquire their properties relationally. Quarks acquire their properties from the relations to quarks uh, and the context within that they encounter those quarks. In the same sense, chemical elements, of course, uh, acquire their properties from the relations of atoms, relating in particular ways in particular contexts. Now, since we humans, of course, do not, of course, exist outside of the universe in any sense uh, or shape or form, the humans, too, of course, according to this view, are not thing-like, in essence, uh, distinct objects moving in backgrounds. Rather, you, uh, us, we are all sets of moving relations, if you like, uh, uh, sets of moving relations that are processing chemical, biological, informational uh, relations. Uh, relating to complex, complex sets of uh, relations. Now, in so doing, of course, as we are processing through the world, at the same time we are, in some senses, of course, emergent from chemical reactions, biological relations, and so on, but also fundamentally, in so doing, we are necessarily dependent also on energy flows, plant food, uh, at the sun's energy, and so on. In a very real sense, there is no such thing as kind of you outside of the relations uh, that you're in. And of course, in a very similar sense, the social relations that we're in also are part of structuring, structuring these things we call you or I. We're used to those arguments, uh, I suppose, more so in social sciences. Uh, but what's important about relational cosmology is that it points out that the relationality of us in societies is also embedded in much wider relationality uh, outside of social relationality. Now, this kind of view has, I think, some implications. And certainly, relational cosmologists argue that it has imp implications also for how we think we know stuff, how we conceptualize stuff in the universe. Relational cosmology argues that we, of course, are never, in any sense, even when we study physics, we're not outside of the universe uh, or in any sense, shape or form. We never have a God's eye perspective on the universe and stuff uh, in it. Instead, instead, whenever we know anything, we're always embedded uh, in relations in the universe. We are inescapably, if you like, situated knowers in the universe. We can know something about the universe, we can only, only know anything about it uh, situatedly from the relations that we happen to be in. This forces us to accept certain uh, limitations, uh, certainly, as knowers. First of all, we have to accept that quite simply we have certain big limitations in terms of what we're working with, uh, with the brains that we're working with. Our brains are very powerful uh, organs, and they're finely tuned uh, to respond to the survival challenges that we face in the relational context that we're in. They're capable of reasoning, communication, creativity, uh, and so on. But we also have to, of course, recognize that the cognitive capacities of our brains are very deeply reflective of the needs of the type of ape that we are in the relations in the cosmos that we're in. 
we evolved in interesting ways in the survival challenges that we've been facing in the relations that we've been in, but there's nothing obvious uh, about apes like us uh, in terms of us being able to access the relations in the un universe as a whole, the nature of quantum mechanics, uh, and so on. We are always limited knowers, partly because we only know things from the kinds of relations that we're positioned in, that we're situated uh, uh, in. Relational cosmology also demands, of course, that we then recognize some limitations in terms of the use of concepts. We shouldn't assume that our concepts uh, capture things, get at things in the world. Rather, at best, at best our concepts are always, what Lee Smolin calls, approximating or re-approximating to something that we can never quite fully uh, capture. Our concepts, in a sense, then, are uh, always, to borrow Terry Rudolph's phrase, the kind of monkey realistic uh, concepts. Our concepts reflect uh, how we necessarily think, how monkeys like us necessarily uh, think, given our capacities living in our particular kinds of societies. This is exactly why relational cosmologists uh, uh, stress that none of our concepts uh, really captures things in the world. In fact, uh, relational cosmology pushes us to think that science's role in many ways is not to try to capture things at all, but instead to try to mess up, to queer, to, to make less sensible uh, the world uh, around us. In a sense, the challenge for science is to break apart what is sensible for monkeys like us with the concepts that we have. If you think about some of the advances, the, the biggest advances in science, they all have a relation, I think, to this kind of an argument. So if you think about the notion of fields, or the notion of quarks, or the idea of space-time, one of the key aspects of these concepts is that they all are trying to queer, to mess up, to break apart what is sensible for us to think about the world. They're trying to, in a sense, uh, push our situated knowledge towards concepts and conceptualizations that are uncomfortable for us because we can't quite understand them. But the central point of relational cosmology here is to argue that this is the basis of science. The basis, the radical motivation of science is to try to break apart what is sensible uh, for the kinds of thinkers uh, that we necessarily are in the relations and situatedness that we're in. But at this point, um, it could be <laughs> that you're saying to yourself, um, this, is, uh, this is crazy. Surely we know uh, that there's at least certain things. We know certainly that there's such things as laws of, of physics. They exist objectively out there, and we know them objectively through mathematics. Now, those of you that know uh, Peter, my partner, knows that he makes this sort of argument uh, uh, repeatedly to me. Surely we can know uh, something about the laws of physics uh, and surely we can know these laws of physics, at least in part, through the maths uh, that we can use to describe the nature of these universal laws of physics. But relational cosmology explicitly argues that no, we can't do that uh, either. And that's because the laws, the whole concept of laws, as relational uh, cosmology sees it, um, it's actually an idea, a religious idea, in essence, popularized by Newton, um, but also others, where God supposedly created uh, laws that stand as some sort of stable uh, background of the cosmos. But laws of physics for relational cosmologists, even laws of physics, must be of the universe and evolving with the universe, the relations in the universe. And as such, for Lee Smolin, laws themselves uh, are also just kind of shorthand ways of describing complex, historically evolving processes from the point of view of situated knowers. Laws are not fixed in the universe and they are not a, a background and we can't also access them as if they are somehow outside of the universe or somehow we are, are outside of the universe. This is exactly why mathematics is problematic for physics, uh, Lee Smolin and relational cosmologists argue. When physicists try to understand the world through mathematics, of course, they tend to remove themselves somehow from the universe or the laws of physics uh, from the universe. But this is impossible because there is no outside, no mathematical structure outside, no, no kind of structure outside of the universe it's, itself. 
And interestingly, what this leads uh, Lee Smolling and relational cosmologies to is the argument that what physics actually needs today in order to uh, deal with the crisis in physics uh, that they argue that there is today, they argue that actually what physics needs is more of the methods, if you like, of social and historical sciences. Attempts to try to historically understand the evolution and processing of relations in the cosmos, and thus what we need really is more kind of social physics, but the other way around from how that concept used to be uh, used in the past. Now, in emphasizing relationality and in emphasizing situated knowledge, this cosmological approach, I think, tries to challenge uh, certain conceptual attractions, if you like, our attractions to concepts of things, att attractions to concepts of laws and backgrounds and rational uh, knowers and so on. Relational cosmologists argue that these kinds of assumptions about us being able to know rationally somehow from the outside and so on are important legacies and they're important legacies of Judeo-Christian and Greek uh, cosmologies and they could and might be even very important for our conceptual universities today in the societies that we live in. But what relational cosmologists are arguing that in fact we already have, in a sense, the situated knowledge to push away, to reapproximate from these kinds of conceptions uh, of the world. Now, the key question, of course, uh, for us then is, what does all this mean for the study of international relation? That's, of course, what we're here uh, to talk about. Now, my hunch is, and this is the hunch that drives this crazy book that I'm writing at the moment, my hunch is that this view actually has some very interesting things to say <coughs> to how we theorize and approach the study of theory of international relations. There are a number of moves I'm working on, but I want to talk to you about three uh, moves that I'm working on. One suggests that we can think about our knowledge and conceptualizations in somewhat different uh, ways. If you like, we might push ourselves a little bit differently epistemologically in international relations. The second move relates to how we might conceptualize the subject matter of international relations, if you like, the ontology of international relations. And third, I'll make some few brief comments about how we might ethically and politically orient to the world from this kind of view on the world. Now first, as someone that is interested in concepts and knowledge through concepts, what is interesting for me about relational cosmology is that it suggests that we orient, reoriented at least slightly to how it is that we might know through concepts in international relations. The relational picture forces us, if you like, to face up to the fact that all knowledge in international relations is situated and approximate. Monkey realistic concepts trying to get at things and yet never really fully being able to do so. Now this is a deeper challenge, I think, to us social scientists, at least it is to me, uh, far deeper challenge than I think I, I, I realised in some ways. And why is this? I think it's because what it emphasises is that even as we are concerned about social construction knowledge and situating knowledge in constructivist and critical theoretical uh, uh, ways of coming at the world, what the relational cosmology, I suppose, is suggesting uh, is that even though we think we can know the humans through our kind of human concepts, there's a problem here because we don't necessarily have access to the humans through the human concepts, uh, even if we might think we have. For relational cosmology, uh, the problem, I suppose, is we can't sidestep the limitations of our own human knowledge uh, about the human, the social, by appealing to our special humanity. In fact, relational cosmology suggests quite the opposite, that maybe humans and social relations in many ways, ways are the most difficult things for us to know, partly because we are uh, uh, so uh, not only complex, but also we are so very close to the things that we call humans, things that we uh, study. The problem, in essence, is that our monkey realistic attempts, if you want to call it that, uh, our monkey realistic concepts describe ourselves through the social realities uh, and the conceptions developed in the social realities of the monkeys themselves. For me, this says that whenever uh, I explain, say, war through anarchy or self-interest or perhaps more realistically, when I try to explain the dominance of liberal economic ideas by the construction of ideological hegemony of, uh, uh, in democracy promotion, for example, 
What this is saying is that our conceptual explanations always, all, always are perhaps interesting, uh, but they're also perhaps sensible, but at the same time, in many ways and in a fundamental ways, they're always reproducing uh, monkey realisms, our uh, monkey realisms. They reproduce what appears to be sensible uh, to us, where we are, where we come from, from where we explain. They never capture human or social relations uh, as such. And this means, to me at least, or has pushed me to think in new ways about what this means for thinking about the kind of knowledge that we should be pushing for in international relations. And what I've, argued, what I've tried to argue uh, 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 recently is that what we, what we should be doing is pushing for this thing I call stretchy situated knowledge. And that is a kind of knowledge that is situating our knowledge, recognizing the situatedness of all our knowledge through our concepts, but at the same time is trying to, explicitly trying to stretch away from what feels comfortable. Stretch away uh, from what people think, how we think, how I think. Now this kind of uh, knowledge uh, which calls to, if you like, to push away, to stretch away, uh, to mess up what makes uh, sense to us, um, I think it's a, it's a challenge to various types of IR theory. It's certainly a challenge uh, to the guys that I've been criticizing for some time, uh, the positivists, uh, who would argue that if we have the right kinds of concepts and if we have the right kinds of facts, then we can aspire to some sort of objective knowledge in international politics. If you're tempted by these ways of looking at the world, then certainly this perspective says, if you think you have the truth about international relations through your concepts, through your facts, through your theories, then think again about whether these facts, these theories, these concepts are simply actually perhaps monkey realistic concepts for you, but also monkey realistic for the kinds of societies that you come from. But if you are already uh, with this kind of a move and you're within the critical, uh, uh, critical or constructivist or feminist uh, lenses where you're regularly already situating your knowledge uh, in conceptual systems, the challenge here, I suppose, is exactly this issue of stretching away. My interest in situated knowledge started from uh, interest in feminist, uh, feminist epistemology on situated knowledge. But the emphasis here is very much on situating uh, into the relations. What stretchy situated knowledge from the relational cosmology viewpoint emphasizes is that we have to be really very wary of this glorification of situatedness. In fact, what we need to try to deal with in order to deal with situated knowledge is exactly to stretch away, to force ourselves to abstract away um, from what it is that we situatedly know. Now in emphasizing this, uh, I think it's interesting that relational cosmology sits much better and much more closely, interestingly, with critical theory, especially of the kind of negative Adornoian kind, I think, but also with post-structuralism. These are two theoretical strands of thought which helpfully, I think, get at the discomfort that we should have with our concepts. They get at the kind of inadequacy of our concepts and also the need to kind of mess up to undo the concepts that we work with. But even here, I think there is something of a challenge from this particular perspective, partly because relational cosmology, of course, comes from science and it comes very much, in my perspective, also from scientific uh, realism. And in that sense, the scepticisms amongst some of the humanist uh, strands of critical theory, I think, have to be uh, cast aside on some level. This is particularly controversial in the sense that what relational cosmology, or at least in my interpretation of it, suggests is that actually it is scientists, natural scientists, physical scientists, other kinds of scientists other than us, social scientists, that can actually point the way in important ways to reapproximations, to rethinking uh, of our concepts to conceptualize away, if you like, from the kinds of assumptions that we work with. Now, Lee Smolin and others are fully recognize, I think, and I think they're right in recognizing that social and natural uh, science conceptualizations kind of tend to move in parallel, not hand in hand necessarily, uh, but in parallel. So if you think back to Newton's uh, conception uh, of laws of uh, gravity and planetary bodies in those laws, and you compare that to John Locke's idea of uh, uh, liberal individuals with particles moving against backgrounds, then there is some work to be done, I think, in thinking through what the implications for thinking about international relations and its theories and its concepts that hark back a fair amount of time, a lot of them, 
what the implications for our thinking about international relations is of the fact that sciences have undone and are undoing the concept of Newton's laws and also the concepts of things. So I think what this relational cosmology points to, in a sense, is a rethinking in many ways of the legacies uh, of Newtonian uh, cosmologies, also Judeo-Christian uh, cosmologies, also of the kind of secular common sense uh, uh, cosmologies that we uh, work with, also, I think, in IR. Now, let me then move on to talk about uh, how we might reconceptualize this thing we call international relations. How we might reorient, if you like, to the ontologies, so to speak, <coughs> of international relations. Now, there are various ways in which I'm trying to uh, develop this uh, at the moment, but let me talk about one particular reorientation that has arisen from this relational uh, cosmology way of looking at the world, uh, at least for me. And it's quite a subtle reorientation in some senses, but it's an interesting and, and at least for me, I think quite surprising. Now, this orientation uh, is not, I would guess, uh, what you might expect it to be in the sense that what I'm, not, what I'm saying is not that to adopt a cosmological perspective on international relations somehow means that we take ourselves, we lift ourselves off the planet, we look back down on the planet and say, now we all realize that we should be global citizens and we should hold hands and overcome the prejudices, national, religious, and so on, uh, on this planet. Now, this kind of point of view drawn from cosmologists themselves is, of course, I think is important. So if you think about Carl Sagan, or if you think about uh, even Brian Cox's uh, writings and TV programs recently, you can see this sense and so you, can, you can see the explicit argument that actually uh, what should happen on this planet is that we should rethink our human relations and our petty differences from the point of view of looking at ourselves uh, somehow from a bigger picture point of view. But what's interesting to me about relational cosmology is that, in a sense, it suggests quite the opposite. Instead of suggesting that we should lift ourselves off the planet, which is actually resembling in many ways exactly the kind of Judeo-Christian and, and, and early scientific points of view where you can lift yourself outside of the universe and try to know it objectively from the outside. Instead, what relational cosmology, I suggest, is quite the opposite kind of move. I think it, uh, it, it would suggest that we try to ground, if you like, ourselves back into the relations that we're off and that, that we're in. It's about, if you like, rethinking how we see relations and how we relate different kinds of relations as we think the subject matter of international relations. But how do we think, how do we think uh, relations in international relations? Now, of course, international relations is fundamentally, in many ways, about relations. Uh, it's classically, of course, about the relations uh, between states, uh, these things we call the states. But relations here, at least according to a lot of realism and a lot of liberalism, are relations between these states, thing-like objects, interacting somehow against the a, a background of the planet, the, the cosmos, and so on, but a cold, rather inanimate uh, background. We're in a kind of a Newtonian human conceptual uh, universe. But of course, many critical theorists for some decades now have been arguing that we cannot understand international relations if we only look at the relations between uh, states. We have to uh, think about what you might call global social relations, the ways in which global social relations are structuring and interacting with, if you like, uh, the ways in which international relations are embedded in uh, global social relations global class relations, global gender relations, global cultural relations, uh, and, and so on. Now, this seems eminently sensible uh, to me. But what has seemed less sensible to me is what relational cosmology has forced me uh, to think about, that perhaps international politics cannot be captured by international relations between states or even global social relations uh, between humans. What relational cosmology in many ways points to, I think, is a view of international relations that forces us to think about uh, international relations as being not just about human relations, but also what we might call uh, parasitic uh, relations. Now, we are, of course, absolutely parasitically uh, uh, involved with each other on this planet, so we have human parasitic relations. But we also have, on a fundamental level, uh, parasitic relations 
with mineral circulations on the planet, uh, with bacteria, with the plants that we have to eat in order to reproduce uh, social and political relations and so on. On this view then, uh, these things, bacteria, <laughs> Uh, plants and so on, they're not some sort of inanimate background, if you like, for human relations. On this view, human relations are not distinct, but fundamentally facilitated by parasitic relations that we're in. And we, in turn, structure parasitic relations, responses, feedback loops on this planet in complex kinds of ways. On this view, then, more wars, and markets and global e epidemics and so on, all, in, all seem to involve mediations of multiple sets of relations, human and non-human non type of relations. Indeed, you could go as far as to say that most of the biggest uh, problems in international relations today relate to how we negotiate between humans, but between humans in the context of relations with animals, plants, ecosystems, climate, bacteria and microbes. If you think about flu viruses, or if you think about food production systems, or if you even think about things like the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean at the moment, on a fundamental level, these issues are not really about human interaction problems only. They're, about, they're at the fundamental level about how humans negotiate and structure human and non-human relations. What well, relational cosmology uh, challenges then, much like complexity theory, I think, much like ecologism and much like uh, a lot of new forms of materialism, if you like, in international politics, is the habitual tendency, if you like, to study and practice international relations by focusing on human interactions. It suggests that we should perhaps focus on understanding uh, uh, our various types of relations, our various types of attachments uh, and systemic entanglements, if you like, uh, with the various types of relations uh, that we're embedded in. Now, if that move uh, seems sensible, here's the next move that is not so sensible, even to me, uh, that uh, sometimes is pushing it a bit too far. But I think it's important to also just note that, of course, on a fundamental level, from a relational cosmology point of view, we are also embedded in these things called cosmological relations. Cosmological relations in the sense of the dust clouds, the movement of dust clouds in the Milky Way that on a fundamental level affect <coughs> gravitational movements of bodies in our solar system. We have also uh, cosmological relations with the asteroids that might just have uh, our name uh, on them. In a very fundamental way, even if we like to put it into the background, we say it's part about the background, it's not to do with the problem of international relations, but of course on a fundamental level, the very possibility of social global relations or human relations of any kind on this planet is, is dependent on the kinds of cosmological relations that we're having to uh, negotiate. On a fundamental level also, literally the problems of international relations and the problems of global social relations might have to force us to uh, reckon with the fact that we also have to have responses through these international relations and global social relations uh, to the challenges of the kinds of cosmological relations that we necessarily uh, embedded in. Now this also may sound a little uh, strange to you. I must say it has felt a little strange to me, which is, I think, partly why I've been pushing this lecture off for as long as I, uh, I have. I think I've always been a, quite a fervent uh, humanist, focusing on humans, conceptualizing humans about human problems uh, against some sort of inanimate uh, background, I think. But relational cosmology has urged me to take on some of my quite religious, I think, uh, humanisms, and to challenge uh, also to think what it is practical for international relations uh, to think about. Theorizing human interaction problems against some sort of inanimate uh, backgrounds may seem sensible, uh, it may even seem practical, but perhaps on this view at least, uh, it could just be that it's somehow not just practical, but it could just be monkey realistic on some level. It's exactly, this is exactly why I think it's quite important to recognize that in IR there is a rise of various forms of relational thinking, complexity theory, ecologism, new materialism, and so on. Also in physics, you have the rise of some uh, uh, relational forms of thinking, not least relational cosmology. Lee Smolin uh, argues that there is, if you like, a rev revolution of relational thinking uh, on already on its way. 
perhaps we are abandoning the gods and the secular theology of, of ourselves uh, in nature, as nature somehow special ch children. Uh, and in some level, I think the book that I'm writing at the moment is about saying that I hope that is the case, and I hope I somehow can contribute to it. But finally, uh, I said I'd talk also a little bit about ethical uh, and political uh, consequences of, let's call it, this relational uh, revolution. What does it mean to think in terms of relations from, uh, from the point of view of kind of ethics or politics? Now here, as most of you know, I'm well out of my depth because I'm not much of an ethicist or political theorist. But there's two points, I think, that are worth uh, making that at least have arisen to me that are, are, are interesting. I think this perspective would confirm in many ways what a lot of political theorists uh, and a lot of ethicists have already been arguing for some time. But there are no such, thing, no such things, there really are no such things as universal moral laws in the context that we're in. We might have uh, ethics uh, that we negotiate between uh, each other in our relations, but there are no universal moral laws, no universal human rights as if they were somehow prescribed outside of the cosmos. The kind of uh, ethics and the kinds of negotiations of ethics that we have must be, I think, of the relations uh, that we're in and in the relations that we're in. But it would seem that if we derive our ethics and our politics from the relations between uh, us, uh, then it also would entail, I think this would entail for us, that we have to also think about ethical commitments that go beyond the relations between the humans. Because if human relations is not really all, all that matters, if you like, uh, for us, but also on this planet, then actually we might have to think about the kinds of, kinds of ethical arguments about post-human uh, uh, ethics that post-humanist and ecologists have been pointing towards. Again, our sensibilities, which prioritize us as the ethically most important things in the planet, on the planet, uh, they may be attractive, but it could be that these sensibilities are really quite a far way off. They can, could be quite a far way off from what we know about the universe from our situated uh, political uh, uh, and, and, and epistemological points of view. Okay. We've uh, covered a lot of uh, ground, so let me try and uh, wrap up. Um, I think what I've tried to suggest this evening is that we need to think carefully uh, about our concepts and how we know through our concepts. International politics is fundamentally wrapped up with and in fact lives through the kinds of conceptual universes uh, uh, that, that it's, it revolved, revolves around. Reflecting on and challenging uh, concepts and conceptualizations of concepts in the study and practice of IR is important then. But dealing with concepts is very tricky. Our conceptual universes are shifting and they're contested and they're also socially uh, inherited and constructed. More than that, what I've tried to suggest today, I suppose, is that we and our concepts are not only socially situated, but we're also situated in the universe. Now, taking science and also scientific realism seriously, relational cosmology that I've been talking about today leads us to a position where we have to, absolutely, we have to situate our knowledge and ourselves. But to do so, I think, requires two things. One, it emphasizes for social scientists and international relations scholars that we need to, to understand and to deal with the situatedness of our knowledge. To do so, we need to also uh, address more than social science, uh, more than even human sciences. We need a cross-disciplinary debate. Uh, we need it in social sciences in order to reapproximate our concepts, but at the same time, the physicists also need it too. And this is exactly what Lee Smolin uh, argues. Secondly, I think this relational cosmology point of view emphasizes that we also need to, if you like, uh, push away to abstract, uh, to, to stretch our social uh, concepts almost as a practice uh, of, 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 of being in international relations or being a socially situated being in the universe. Relational cosmology is essentially trying to call upon us to challenge the the kinds of uh, uh, theological, but also the kinds of uh, old, perhaps even Greek, uh, uh, cosmologies that we seem to carry around in a lot of our concepts in the way in which we orient to thinking about us and our knowledge and our concepts uh, in, in, in the universe, but also uh, in international relations. 
Relational cosmology then is trying to call upon us to think on, but also to stretch away from socially inherited uh, cosmologies. But what to? What, what is it that we're stretching to? Well, here, relational cosmology, of course, is very disturbing in the sense that it robs us really of any final destinies, any God's eye view of knowledge, but also any God's eye view of ethics. It presents no final uh, truth whatsoever for, for monkeys like us, if you, uh, like us, if you like, but also it promises no heaven on earth where we can hold hands in a big scary cosmos and so on. What relational cosmology gives us, I think, is quite simply a, a kind of relating back into the relations uh, in the world that we're in. And in so doing, I think it also gives us may have perhaps some kind of humility in terms of the uh, limitations of our knowledge, but also I think it gives us a, 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 some tools perhaps to face some of the complex kinds of negotiations uh, with our many human and non-human uh, related processes uh, in the universe. Limited and situated as we are, we do of course have some say in how we negotiate these relations uh, on the planet and with the planet and also, I suppose, in the universe. But it's worth also noting that perhaps to address some of the problems of international relations today, some of the problems that humans are having to face in terms of coordination of their own internal relations, but also their relations uh, with the non-humans, in order to address these issues, it could very well be that what we need is not so much more human action, human panic, even human thinking, but more reconceptualization and conceptualization uh, of our predicament. In a way, what I'm trying to suggest this evening, I think, is that in conceptualization, I at least suspect there's a lot more to do. In fact, from this relational cosmology perspective, in conceptualization, there is always uh, a lot more to do. That's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> much and I believe when it comes to human and non-human relations uh, I'm a big fan of the type of uh, interaction that we, I think we have over the other side of the doors I think there's a glass of wine off at all thank you very much for the attention thanks